if you know the Lord will take care of you. All you have to do is put your trust in him, and he promised he would do that. Won't you give the Lord a hand praise for Antioch Bible Fellowship? Thank you, choir director. Thank you, musicians. Thank you, preachers of the gospel. And we thank God for our sister who worshiped God in the dance. Amen. God bless you. Bless your hearts. To all of you, to my father's children, I bring you greetings in the name of our father, uh, his son, and the Holy Spirit, who's our divine keeper, to the honorees of this day. Amen. To Pastor White, Lady White, Bria, and Frank Jr., God bless you. Thank you for letting me be your friend, and thank you for allowing us to be here. May we bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so very much for this day. We ask that you speak to us and speak through us, and we promise we'll give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We thank God for um, our ushers that are here, deacons that are here, my wife, uh, Lady Tina, you know, when you're married to a preacher, sometimes preachers go in different directions because they have different assignments. Uh, we're happy to be here with you on today, and we thank God for the privilege and for the opportunity. Happy anniversary and appreciation day. It seems like it was just the other day. Um, 16 years goes by very fast, but we're so grateful. We thank God for it. Somebody said when it goes by fast, that means you're having fun. When it seems like it's been a long time, that's another story. Amen. But we're so grateful it's been going by fast. Look with me into the word of God in Ephesians, the fourth chapter. A very powerful word, and thank you so very much for reading that. Uh, we thank God for you, and we thank God for our worship leader, uh, he is so skillful at it, and he knows how to put us in the attitude of worship and praise to God. Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the first verse, the King James rendering of the text. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation in which you are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, there is one spirit, even as you are called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith that when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but also that he descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is also, is same also who ascended up far above all things, uh, above heaven to fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. For the next few uh, minutes, or as the Holy Spirit permits, I want to talk about this text um, is, is very interesting and intriguing to me because Paul writes it uh, as one of those letters uh, that he writes to the various churches in Asia Minor. Uh, we attribute this writing to Paul because Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus to remind them about things that are happening and things that are about to come and how they should endure in the midst of all of that. But in this letter, it's very intriguing to me because um, as he begins to write to them, he tells them, let everybody first know and understand that I'm a prisoner of the Lord. He know to whom he belongs. And he tells us to walk worthy of the vocation in which we are called. So if you don't mind, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, for the next few moments, we are in the equipment room. Tell your other neighbor, neighbor, we're in the equipment room. As I pondered this moment, this day in this text, I couldn't help but think about my own life as a young person and my life as one who aspired towards athletics. I remember I spent more of my time in the equipment room than I did actually on the floor or on the field. In my junior high school years, my, my mom and my dad agreed I was too small to play football, uh, even though I differed with them. 
Uh, but they said I was too small to play football. They didn't mind if I played a little bit of tag, a little bit of touch, but they didn't want me to play contact football. Uh, this was when I was a student at J.T. Wilson Junior High back in the day. Uh, that was before we called them middle schools. It was junior high school. And so while I was in junior high school, I was the equipment manager for the football team. I had the wonderful opportunity of making sure that I washed the jerseys, washed the pants, put everybody's equipment in their right cubby. Don't you know there's different helmets for a quarterback as it is for a defensive guard, as it is for a tackle, as it is for a center? All of them have different headgear because they are designed for a different and a unique purpose. And throughout life, oftentimes we forget that all of us are designed for a very unique purpose, and there's not one that fits all. But Antioch, you have been so blessed and so powerful. You have a, you have a pastor and a first family that fit a whole lot of different helmets. Your pastor has been one who's been skillful in so many ways in so many areas. I always tell him, when I grow up, I want to be like him. Amen. And I wanted to tease him to tell him if he was really my good friend, he would have put another platform so I can be tall enough to see <laughs> over this one. But I'm just so grateful that I can occupy the space that I'm in. Amen. So what happens is that in this whole context that Paul writes to the church, he couldn't help but make us think about how you and I find ourselves in the equipment room. When I was there, I had to make sure that all of the players had just what they need because it was designed for a special use just for them when they're on and off the field. This text begins to help us to understand how Paul, how Paul looked and saw what was happening as he writes some of these prison epistles. Notice he finds himself behind barred windows. He sees what's happening all around him. He looked at all of the Greek athletes as he watched them and observed them. He noticed there's some peculiarities and some peculiar ways in which they behave because he knows all of them are all gifted in one or two specific areas. And when I read that, it helps me to understand how he illuminates verse 11 like never before. It says that, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so when we read this text, it lets us see that all of us have a gift and have a calling. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, you've been called. Have you answered? The truth of the matter, all of us have been called to do something, but all of us don't answer the call. I can remember how my mom and how my dad, they limited us on how far we can play outside of the ranks of what we would call our backyard and front yard. It was all right for us to go across the street and play with the Baxters, go in the backyard to play with the Stedmans, to go maybe three houses down the street to play with the Agnews. And it was all right to go over on Inglehart and, and shoot basketball uh, with the twins, with the Campbell twins. But Mama said and Daddy said, don't get too far because you might not hear me when I call you. I don't know about y'all, but uh, the way we operate is before the streetlights came on, you had to be home. Because they would say, don't let me have to call you. Because if you get called, it's a different kind of calling. But our text on today reminds us and it helps us to understand that all of us have been called. The question is, have you answered the call? Uh, the Apostle Paul, the one who was known as Saul of Tarsus, who was on the road to Damascus, then he had a calling from God that met him, and we found himself being blinded until he could clarify what God had for him to do. He had to go and meet a man, a man who was a prophet, a man who would tell him everything that he needed to know Ananias, who schooled him and educated him to teach him, you need to sit down and wait a little while before you enter on this new endeavor that God has given you. Now, all of us know that Pastor White has been very trained. He has been very skilled in many different disciplines. But the discipline that we have to talk about today is called to be a pastor. Pastoring is not for the faint of heart. Pastoring is for those that God has called and those whom God has sent. Others who went, you found out they came back and decided it wasn't for them. But when you've been called to be a pastor, you know the Lord has called you. And for that reason, today we want to talk about being in the equipment room. Notice it says that 
God does something first to let you know that you are worthy to be called. Let's just see here. It says that before Christ called any of us, he did all the work on our behalf. Just as I go back to that equipment room, before the players could take the field, I had to do some work to get them ready. It meant after school, I had to wash the game uniforms while they practice in the practice uniforms. You know, there's a difference in the practice uniform and the game uniform. See, the practice uniform doesn't have the colors that you use when you're at home and when you're away. It's a different kind of uniform. It's made to be a little bit rugged. It's not made for everybody to see you in it, but it's made for the purposes of practice. In essence, it's the uniform that you wear that sometimes you get dirtier than most. And being one who is called to be a pastor, sometimes you have to wear the practice uniform more than you ever would have envisioned. You see, the practice uniform, it had built-in knee pads. Pastor, I bet you spent a lot of days on your knees. That's the reason why you got to have knee pads, because when you wear knee pads, it protects you and it reminds you that every time you go down, God has given you some protection or he buffers what you have on your knees. Any and every good pastor knows that you got to spend some time on your knees praying. God in heaven knows you spend some time on your knees asking yourself questions. Lord, why did you call me? Couldn't you have called somebody else? You know, it helps me think about how sometimes those of us who are old enough, you remember how you used to share a party line with somebody. I know my grandmother back in Georgia, uh, she shared a party line with Miss Wilkes, who was just up the road a little bit. And so when the phone rang, you would sometimes answer the phone, and they would be calling Miss Wilkes as opposed to Mrs. Anderson. And, and Grandma Ethel would be on the phone for just a few minutes, and she said, oh, that's for you, Miss Wilkes. Let me hang up. You know, it's amazing. I think some of us uh, got on a party line when God was calling somebody. We were listening in thinking he was calling us. You know, that's why some of us try to pastor. I ain't going to stay that long. You, you know how some of us do. Uh, we we want to tell the pastor how to pastor. Well, pastor, if it were me, well, that's why it's not you. Because, you know, some of us know if we haven't been called, we would tell folk off. And then the church would be empty for real, all right? Let me get on back to the text. So notice what it does. He says that he does some of the work on our behalf. Jesus descends first to the lower parts of the earth. What he does is that he goes to the lower parts of the earth and he defeats Satan because he did it at Calvary's cross. He descended as also the one who ascended. That meant he went down to the pit of hell, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, and said, all power is in my hands. Now, since Jesus has the power in his hands, everybody understands what he did at Calvary. He did a total work, not a partial work. He defeated Satan and all of his imps, and now he has all power in his hands. And now, since he has all power in his hands, he now gives to us in verse 11 what we call the five-fold ministry. He lets us know that all of us have a work to do when God calls us. In verse 11, it lets us see he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. Often we find out that he always mentions pastors as number four. He mentions them as number four because you can think of each one of these as a being uh, a part of our hand. The first one that he talks about, he talks about some that are apostles. You know, the thumb is the one that anchors you. We have to be reminded that uh, Jesus called those who would be apostles. They are the anchors. They are the ones that keep us rooted, to keep us connected to the gospel. Notice not only that, it said he gave some prophets. Remember, prophets are the one that point and tell you when you're doing wrong. You know, a lot of folk nowadays call themselves apostles, call themselves prophets. I wonder, have they passed all the tests to become one of those? Thirdly, he gives us, and I'm, I'm always reminded, whenever you talk about that third finger, it's the longest finger that you have, but you never demonstrate it by showing it to folk. Amen. You keep it with the other three. It's the longest fingers, and that's the evangelist because they reach out and they get folk who are out there to bring them in. And then fourthly, he talks about pastors. See, the pastor 
is the fourth finger, which is the ring finger. It means that they are wedded to the gospel and wedded to the people that God gives them to pastor, that they'll be with you. They're like that good old song, ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, ain't no river wide enough to keep me from ministering to you. It's amazing. Keep, I'm trying to keep it spiritual. I was using an illustration. A natural illustration that has some heavenly practicality to go along with it. And pastors are willing to do that because their love is so great. Pastor White has been a man who loves the people of God that God gives him to serve. Oh, I, I, I thought I would get a hand praise to God for that. Amen. He's the one that doesn't mind taking care of you late in the midnight hours. He's the one that doesn't mind getting up early. He's the one that prepares sermon after sermon. He's the one that goes to the last mile with you and for you. He's the one that's there with you when your children are born into the world. He's there with you when your loved ones leave this world. He's the one who's there with you when you're at the hospital. He's the one that is there with you when you're going through the challenges of life. He promises he'll do his ample best to be there. So the past Pastor becomes the one who's right there to help you out. And today you've paused that you might tell God, thank you for your pastor. Well, I'm happy the church is known as an equipment room. Because whenever you get into the equipment room, you have everything that you need if you're just willing to put it on. That's the reason we find out that later on in Ephesians that the pastor does the work. And he tells us that he is to equip us to do the work of the ministry. It lets us see here in verse number 12, all of this is done for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, who will all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Whenever we get in the equipment room and when we see that the pastor has been in the equipment room, that means he's working to help perfect the saints. Notice it says for the perfecting of the saints, which means you never become perfect, but you're always striving to get there. What happens is that all the preaching, all the teaching, all the moments of praise is to help us to grow, to do what we've been called to do, that we might edify the body of Christ. The pastor is the one that helps us to do that. And when you know you're in the equipment room is then you know that you must put on the whole armor of God. He tells us later on in the sixth chapter to put on the helmet of salvation. That's what you hear, how the devil tries to come against our minds. That's the reason you got to protect your head. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, put on your helmet. When you and I have on the helmet of salvation, then we don't have to worry about the devil trying to whisper in our ears. Because we already have a communication that's sending us messages from the sideline. But not only is it the sideline, but it's really the main line. Somebody said Jesus is on the main line. He will tell you what you need to hear and what you want to hear. And whenever you have on the helmet of salvation, you got to put on the rest of the uniform. That means you have to put on the breastplate of righteousness. That means be careful what comes close to your heart. The Bible tells us that the heart can be deceitfully wicked. That's the reason we must make sure that our hearts are protected. That means don't let other things get closer to you than you do almighty God. When you protect your heart is then you understand you have to put on all of the rest of the equipment. He says, gird up your loins with truth. Uh, that means the word of God is the truth of God. Then he tells us to have our feet shod with the preparation of of the gospel of peace. Well, every time you come for Bible study, you're coming to the equipment room. Every time you come for worship, you're coming to the equipment room. But all you have to do is put on all the equipment. You see, some of us only put on part of the equipment. That's the reason why we have to keep the shield closed. That means we won't run off the mouth if the shield is closed. But rather, we'll make sure that the Lord is speaking to us before we speak something we ought not. And when we put on everything that God would have us to put on, then we will mount up and become a mighty army. Then we can say that we are soldiers on the battlefield and we're fighting for our Lord. 
And when you and I are soldiers on the battlefield, it lets us know that the evil one will come at us every moment he gets. But you got to make sure that you have the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I can remember watching those shows on the TV. I remember as a young fella watching the cartoons when they were sword fight. They would say on God. That meant that now I'm ready to get in the fight because I have the sword in my hand. When the devil comes at us, we must use the sword of the spirit to let him know no weapon formed against us shall prosper. To let him know that I've been trained, I've been in the equipment room. Why? Because my pastor give us all the equipment that we need. And when you have everything that you need, the devil might try to come and entice you, but you let him know I got on all that I need. But even more so in verse 24, you let him know that I'm now a new man. I'm walking after righteousness and true holiness. I'm now a new woman and I have everything that I need. Why? Because God has given me a good pastor. And a good pastor ought to be treated with good respect. Not only that, but the Bible says not only should they be given honor, but they should be given double honor because they labor among you. And now Antioch, the place where they were first called Christians, you have done a good work to honor your pastor, to tell him thank you so very much for being a good pastor. Thank you for giving us what we need. Thank you for feeding us a well-balanced diet. Thank you for giving us not just steak, but thank you for giving us some vegetables. Thank you for not only giving us the vegetables, but thank you for giving us a little bit of cornbread every now and then. And then we want to tell you thank you for after you've given us the full course meal, you don't mind giving us some dessert to let us know that God will give us blessing on top of blessing. And that every day with Jesus becomes sweeter than the day before. That means you don't mind doing what God has called you to do. God has called us as the body of Christ to go out and bring souls into the kingdom. He's taught us to tell them about the goodness of the Lord. But the only way you can do that is you have to be equipped for the service. And when we're fully equipped, you don't have to worry about nobody bumping you off course. Have you ever seen the way a good running back will run with the ball? You see, a good running back will come through the number three or the number four hole. And once he runs into somebody, he rolls right off and keep on going. You see, you got to be good and light on your feet to understand that it's the preparation of the gospel. And you're opening up a way for somebody else. But then you got to keep on running. The devil might run behind you, but you got to put it in full stride. You got to run because you see the finish line. I stopped by pastor and people to say keep on running for the goal. The apostle Paul said, I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I not only have natural attainment, but I realize that spiritual attainment. We all got to cross the finish line. And then when we cross the finish line, we going to do our victory dance. You know, every football player has a victory dance when they've crossed the finish line. Nowadays, they do all sorts of finishes. But you and I got to know that when we get to the end of our journey, not only will we cross the goal, but we're going to meet the King of Kings. We're going to meet the Lord of Lords. We're going to meet the one that said, I've been waiting you for to come on home. But not only that, my Bible tells me that in Ephesians, there is a grandstand of witnesses that are telling you, Antioch, run on and see what the end's going to be. Telling you, Fountain, run on and see what the end's going to be. Because when we get to the finish line, we're going to meet God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And then, Pastor, he's going to say, I got a reward for you. That has been laid up since the foundations of the earth. And he's going to tell you all, well done, thy good and faithful servant. 
You've been faithful over a few things. Come on up to the joy of the Lord. So tell your neighbor, neighbor, I'm in the equipment room. And now since I have on all the equipment, I'm ready to do my shout. I'm ready to do my dance because I now made it over. When my soul looks back and wonders how I got over, I'll say it was nothing but the grace of God. Antioch made it 16 years with one pastor, the one who called you out and called you to. Now you got to go forth and hit 17 because 17 is just one more digit. 17 hits the number seven. Seven means you've done a complete work. That means you haven't turned around. It means you haven't turned back. But you're ready to keep on running. Don't you know before the game comes? Every now and then you have to wear some tail weights. You wear the weights to let you know sometimes the offensive players don't hit every block. And a defensive player might be hanging on to you. You see, you practice wearing all of those weights. But the Apostle Paul says that God is going to teach us to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily beset us. Antioch is now the fourth quarter. You've now had the two-minute warning. And now you have the ball for the duration of the game. I want to remind you to keep on running. You know how it is how you practice in track. You got to make sure you're running together. So everybody practice with one up and one down. You got to do it in sync. And when all of y'all get together, and when everybody is on the right foot, don't you know you'll be running like nobody's business? And everybody will say, what's happening over there? Oh, Holloway Street. The street that they call a dead end. But really, it's the street where it all begins. You see, you're on an isolated cul-de-sac. Because God says this is the place that you can only come for one purpose. You've come to be equipped. And there's no distractive traffic that's around you. So Antioch, use your position. God has put you in the equipment room. And God is issuing out the equipment. And there is no reason that you don't have everything that you need. So today I want to encourage you to suit up, put your helmet on, and get in the game. Tell your neighbor, neighbor. I'm in the game. How about you? But not only am I in the game, but I'm playing for the championship ring. And when God does what only he does, it is then that you and I realize that we're in this thing together. And when God gives you, as the book of Jeremiah says, a pastor that is after his own heart. That's somebody you can follow. When God gives you a good pastor and a good first family, that's something you can thank God for. Because you and I both know the Bible tells us we should not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. You give him his due, but aren't you happy you have a pastor who's not greedy? That is not all about him, but it's about doing the work of the ministry. And so today, put on your uniform because God is calling you. Put on your helmet. Make sure you have on the right shoes so you can get traction as you go forward. So I stop by to say keep on moving because every successful down you have, the heavenly Referee and umpire is giving the signal to say, first down. And when you get a first down, that means you're moving forward. Don't look back. The Lord has brought you from a mighty long way, but don't look back. Go forward and press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And thank God he's given you a pastor who's a good quarterback, who knows how to call the signals and knows how to run the play. Let the church of God say amen, 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 and amen. Give the Lord a hand praise of worship.
and tell him thank you for all that he has done. The Bible reminds us that after we have given what we call the invitation, then there's always a response.